undermines state security. There are many, many different things, but I think conceptually that's that's what we need to know. Right? So threaten the security of the state. The next is that they disrupt the cultural cohesion of the host nation, disease, subversive ideas, foreign traditions, and that's that's a direct quote, right? So that they, um, I don't really have anything up here, so I'll just put it uh, as an aside to sort of match. Well, actually, that would be, um, where would that go? Contribute to taxes? It would go, I guess, on, on this, um, it would go on this line, but it doesn't really matter. Um, they were, disrupt the cultural cohesion, right? They're, they were seen as a disruption. Right? They were a disruption. And this also goes to the idea of challenging national identity, right? So that um, instead of looking at the community of refugees and the culture that they bring to the particular region where they settle as uh, an opportunity to embrace multiculturalism, it's viewed as an opportunity to, um, to challenge national identity, right? Why is it just, not, this has nothing to do with internally displaced persons, it's just as a conceptual example so that you can get an idea. Why is there an, a little Italy? Why is there a little China? Why is there a little Haiti? Why is there a little Cuba? Why is there a little, you know, a little Havana, right? Why is it that we have all these littles, little, 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 little? Um, for me, the interpretation is, well, that's good. That's a point of sort of cultural immersion within the, for example, United States. You can go to one of these little, quote unquote, communities, and you can immerse yourself in the culture. Right? And this is also good for second language acquisition, cultural immersion. For me, that's a good thing. Um, you can see how someone would use that that little community and use the argument that, well, if there's a little Italy, are they really loyal to the state? Are they loyal to literally? If there's little China, are they loyal to the state? Are they loyal to China? And so on, right? That's sort of the, the sort of conception. Um, what I thought was very, very interesting is this, this is, uh, well, two, two points, four and five, right? Um, after the formation of the welfare state, rather than um, having, and I'm going to conflate both of these, no public duty and the idea of being sort of independent, it was just the opposite, right? My tax dollars, my, as a citizen, if you will, my tax do dollars, my contributions to the state are being used to support refugees, right? Hence the formation of the welfare state in a very loose, general, sort of super generalized sense, right? So that there was an obligation to support. Obligation to. Right, there's an obligation to support. And you can imagine that this perceived obligation uh, did not sit well with many within the uh, community, right? Why, why should I be obligated to support, um, why should I be obligated to support these internally displaced refugees when they present um, sort of national security threat, generalizing, when they present national security threat? when they have loyalty to whatever land that they're from, um, when they are, and their existence is subsistent on my tax dollars, my contribution, this is problematic, right, argues. Another, another concept that I thought that was very, very, very interesting is the technical concept of compassion fatigue, right? Compassion, compassion fatigue. And the idea of compassion fatigue is exactly what it sounds like. It, it's, it's tiring to always be giving, to always be caring, to always be immersed in charity and help for others. That, that, it gets tiring. You typically hear the, the phrase compassion fatigue um, in discourses on nurses and teachers, right? Teachers, like K-12 through educators, compassion fatigue wears them out. There's a high burnout rate. Uh, because you see, well, I'm making contributions, I'm working my butt off, but these students are destined for failure because, <laughs> at least, I'm going to plug it, because at least in the United States, um, educational opportunities are, are attached to property taxes. It's a shame. Um, or for nurses, it's just, you know, there, there's sickness and death and disease and despair around me all day, and I have to have good bedside manners and a great smile, and I go home and I'm exhausted. Obviously, police officers, firemen, sort of public sector workers go through this compassion fatigue. Imagine national compassion fatigue, right? Take that same idea, sort of exponentially, you know, multiply it, you know, indefinitely, 
And just think about what it is on a national level for the nation to be compassionately fatigued. We are tired of having to, there is some legitimacy in this claim, right? We are tired of having to sort of be the, the, um, the, the beacon of all hope for those people who have been displaced, right? It becomes not only economically unsustainable, but uh, I don't like to personify things like the nation because the nation isn't a person, it's a concept. But there is a sense in which the perpetual barrage of images of suffering and pain desensitizes someone to suffering and pain. So the more I am inundated by images of suffering and pain, the less I really care, right? I don't want to get too deep, but um, apathy, unfortunately, is a consequence of uh, overload, system overload, from having been exposed to too much pain and suffering. I, in defense of, of my being, in a sense, I, I become dispassionate. I, I really don't care that those kids are starving. I don't really care that those people are. I got other things to worry about, right? So it, it, it actually ends up being um, um, problematic. And then rather than contributing to taxes, we have just the opposite, right? Donor fatigue, which is another concept. Right? If you could just give $5 a day, so you get $5 a day, and you see another commercial and somebody wants money for, this is just an example, this has really nothing to do with IDP at this level, but just so that you understand, um, give to the starving kids here, so you give. Give to the cats and the dogs who were tortured here, so you give. And there's an earthquake in Haiti, so you give. And th there was an earthquake in Japan, and then you give, and you give, and you give. And you start to realize, holy crap, wow, I'm getting a little exhausted with giving up all this money, right? If we're talking about internally displaced persons, it becomes far more difficult because the motivation to give isn't an individual motivation. That decision is made at the state government level. And what ends up happening is that the, the population that that government serves gets sort of secondary donor fatigue. I'm tired of having my tax dollars go to you fill in the blank, right? Don't, shouldn't I have a say in how my tax dollars are spent? You fill in the blank. And then you have, um, unfortunately, as a consequence, and, and, and this happens in every state, right? There's countless examples where this happens. Um, you then have a growing resentment within the population against their government for having, being so compassionate, right? Think about, you know, our community first, domestic issues first. And the truth is, is that it's far more complicated than that, especially in the era of globalization. Now, for me, at least, the way that I teach the subject is that there, there will increasingly be um, a blurred line between domestic and international. The international is becoming domestic, the domestic is becoming international, and the attempt to sort of say that, you know, what is home, what is, you know, sort of nation, and just define it by sort of geographical borders seems a bit antiquated, right? Um, I log on to Skype and I talk to someone in China, right? Um, I log on to Skype and I discuss information with someone somewhere else. I make transfers and make payments for services to someone on the other side of the globe, right? So the idea that we are domestic simply because we're going to define that wholly in terms of geography is starting to become a, somewhat of an antiquated concept, right? So the question is, how do we incorporate um, this idea into a broader analysis of um, refugee status, right? We need to address globally the notion of refugees and internally displaced people because quickly, and I'm, I can, this is sort of my prediction, and I, know I very rarely do give predictions, but this is my prediction, is that globally this is going to start to become a problem, right? Because as we become more globalized and territorial jurisdictions become more blurred, um, it could conceivably be the case that no one accepts these internally displaced people for the fact that there is this, there is a collective, um, you know, targeting of a group of people. Uh, and when that happens, you know, you're talking about a doomsday scenario on a scale like you've never seen before. I'm not going to fill that out. I'm not going to spell that out. I'll leave it gray and completely ambiguous for a reason and have you fill it out on your own. But uh, that's, that's, that's uh, very important. Actually, what I'll do is I'll shift my notes and let 5.4 start here. And I'll end this section at that point, and then I'll start 5.4 right before. So actually, I'll erase that. This is still 5.3. I'll erase that, and I'll start 5.4 right before international 
uh, protection of refugees. That way, I don't have to sort of break the video up. Uh, usually, the segments are hour-long segments, and I'm approaching my hour now. So, um, hopefully, that makes sense. What I wanted to be able to discuss in this section were the conceptual, as you see, right? The conceptual transformation in how host nations interpreted and responded to internally displaced persons within the confines of their um, domestic jurisdiction. Um, prior to the formation of a welfare state, they viewed them as making contributions, being conscripted for military service, viable productive members of the population. There was no social obligation and so on. After the formation of the welfare state, what we end up recognizing is that fatigue sets in, compassion fatigue sets in. Um, the individuals are, are seen because the lines, literally, the borders, have been drawn thicker. We see outsiders, and obviously xenophobia creeps in at this level, as being a threat to national identity. So that a large population of internally displaced persons within the confines of the nation presents a challenge to national identity and uh, national security threat and all the boogeyman scenarios that follow from sort of xenophobic um, sort of ideological beliefs sort of flood to the forefront and unfortunately uh, this can and often, I erased it, but this can and often does lead to internally displaced persons being expelled from a second host nation, right? So that they're perpetually being expelled from one nation to the next. And that, um, that ultimately leads to the attempt, it does, it leads ultimately to the attempt to just exterminate the problem, right? They're a problem to all of us, let's all of us sit down and get rid of these people because if we push them out, they're going to go into your country and you don't want them back and we don't want them back, so let's just sort of orchestrate the destruction of this population and free both of ourselves from the headache. I hate to say it like that, but I want to keep it super, super sort of black and white so that you can get conceptually the distinction. Huge problem, uh, way more research, way more needs to be done on analyzing the, um, the dispassion and apathy for internally displaced persons the world over. Hopefully uh, you enjoyed the lecture. With that, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Thanks for watching my videos. Goodbye.